This is a talk about how to interpret a visual field. It's a fairly long talk, probably close to 37 minutes, and so you might want to break it up into pieces rather than sitting through it all at once. And it's also very glaucoma-centric, so I'm talking about how I look at a visual field as a glaucoma specialist. I think that most of the concepts would transfer to neuro-ophthalmology fields and retina fields, although some things like the glaucoma hemifield test are specifically glaucoma related. What I'd like to do is just, just take a field and go through the whole thing and tell you how you might look at a visual field, how I look at a visual field. And we're going to talk about a Humphrey field because that's what I have the most experience with and that's mo most of our perimeters, automated perimeters are Humphreys, but the same principles would apply for octopus and other automated static threshold perimeters. So I'm going to break this into five sections. Looking at a single field analysis, looking at some measures of change, ways that the test can be varied to get different information, pitfalls and errors and things that can really trip you up in looking at a visual field, and then I'll just have a few closing comments. So first, let's look at this visual field. This is a patient of mine who has a dense superior arcuate scotoma from glaucoma. And as we look at the field, we see that it's a central 24-2 threshold test. That's the default in our department. Uh, you can use a 30-2. There are other sizes, and we'll talk about that. But the usual test is a 24-2 that actually tests a little farther out here on the nasal horizontal. So it adds a 3 degrees out here, or 6 degrees out here, I'm sorry. Um, so that it, it does look out farther there, but it drops off the 30-2 points in the far periphery because there's a lot of variability in those points. The stimulus size is 3. That's variable. We'll talk about that. It's a white on white or achromatic field. The background is 31.5 apostilbes. That's the normal background. That's not variable. So that's the same background. Illuminance sits in the Goldman perimeter. So it's, the test is done in a photopic way. It's not a dark perimeter, but the perimeter is illuminated. And the strategy here is a CETA standard. We'll talk about that also. We want to make sure that the field is reliable. So there are four reliability parameters on a CETA field. Fixation losses, false positive errors, false negative errors and the gaze tracker. So fixation losses are tested with what's called the heil Krakow technique, where the perimeter maps the blind spot right here. And periodically, a light is sent into the blind spot. And if the patient responds to that, then there must be retina where the blind spot's supposed to be. And that's considered a fixation loss. And you can see this patient has zero of 15 fixation losses. Fixation losses, for me, are the least important of these parameters. Sometimes the test uh, is not done in a way that they accurately measure the blind spot, or some people have very small optic nerves. So if the rest of the parameters are great and the fixation losses are a little high, I often will interpret that field and consider it usable. An adjunct to that is the gaze tracker in which the cornea is followed to see if the patient moves. So you can see in this bar at the bottom every time the patient moves there's an uptick and whenever their machine is not able to tell whether the patient has moved or not then there's this down downward uh, fluctuation. It's remarkable to me how often fixation losses in the gaze tracker don't really go together. But this is another way of measuring how steady the patient is. And in our institution, we have perimetrists watching the patient as he or she performs the test. So for me, the perimetrist comments are very important. You can see this is a very long field. And notice how uh, this patient's fixation gets worse as time passes.
false positive errors are a very important source of uninterpretable visual fields and they are often unfortunately interpreted and so hopefully we will get you to the point where you won't accidentally interpret a false positive field as being pathology. So in a false positive, the test for false positivity, the machine makes a sound like a shutter sound without projecting a light. And patients who are anxious, you know, people always think that they're going blind and so they might be very trigger happy. If they push too often, then those are called false, false positive errors. And here's an example. You can see on the right hand slide at the top, it says 4% false positive errors. And what you notice, and one of the things that should be a real clue to you about false positivity, is the fact that the total deviation is normal. So that's comparing this person with an, another person who's also 73 years old. This person is normal, and yet there are points that are abnormal compared to, her, to the neighboring points. We'll talk about this in perhaps exhaustive, exhausting detail, but when you see this disconnect where the total deviation is normal and the pattern deviation is abnormal, you should think about false positivity. Just another example, the same pattern. You notice here at the blue arrow at the top that there is a white area I call this a dreaded white scotoma. It's clearly not a scotoma, but you can see that these threshold values are astronomically Clark Kent kind of high, 46, 45, 36% uh, false positive errors. So if, this is a totally uninterpretable visual field. If you try to make any sense out of all this, you're just wasting time. Having said that, I don't want you to throw away every field in which there is a disconnect like this because occasionally, and it, to me it's a very small percentage of the time, you can have somebody who has real disease who has this same disconnect between total deviation and pattern deviation. And these are the people whose vision is extraordinarily good. People who have 2010 vision uh, if they have a defect in their visual field, it still may be normal for age, but it's just abnormal for them. And this is an example. There's zero false positives here. Uh, total deviation, a little bit of abnormality, but nothing to write home about, and yet there's this arcuate defect here. Notice how this fits the nerve fiber layer pattern. If we go back to these other fields, uh, not so much. They sort of fit with uh, a random distribution. So this person has a high mean deviation despite having um, this uh, defect in their superior field, no false positive responses. And obviously, like everything in medicine, you have to correlate it with everything else. So this person does have some thinning in the retinal nerve fiber layer, and this is a true visual field defect. False negative errors, and this person again, 0% false negatives, is when the machine makes maps uh, the first few spots and then goes back and, and sends a bright light, brighter than what was thresholded into that spot and the patient doesn't respond. So you often get what's called a cloverleaf field. You can see that the patient has responded to a few of these test points and then basically has stopped participating in the field. It's also important to emphasize that people who have significant glaucoma, even those who are fairly good test takers, can have an elevated false negative response. So false negatives have a little bit less of the um, reject this field value that false positives do. But if you see a field like this, cloverleaf field, you know that it's somebody who just started the field and then stopped participating. 
we, as we go through the field, the foveal threshold, that's often turned off in some uh, perimeters. It's an option to have it on or off. You can see 35 decibels. Real honestly, it's the most important point in this person's field is what their foveal threshold is. Then here we can see the numeric data. And this is decibels of attenuation. So you have a very bright light, 10,000 apostilles. And how far can you attenuate that light and still see it? And so you can see here that these, this point in, can see the unattenuated light. This point can't even see that. So this point is blind to the brightest light of the, uh, of the perimeter. This, at this point, the light can be attenuated by 30 decibels, roughly three log units, and the patient can still see it. So that's what these numbers mean. These numbers are the truth in the visual field. This is what's measured, and everything else is somewhat digested. So whenever you're confused or concerned, you should come back to the numeric data. The grayscale is just a painting of the numeric data. It uh, tells you in a picture what's going on in this patient. If we were real purists, we wouldn't look at the grayscale, but I must admit that I do. This is someone whose grayscale does not have a blind spot. That's okay uh, because these test points are six degrees apart. And if you have a little tiny optic nerve head, it may drop in between the uh, test points. Total deviation is a measure of how much this person's sensitivity at each point varies from someone else their age. So this patient is 53 years old, and these points are depressed significantly, as you would expect looking at the raw data and the grayscale, from somebody else who is 53 years old. It assigns a probability value to the depression of these points. And this is like everything in this in, in total deviation is center weighted. So if you have something that's depressed centrally, it's more important and more reproducible than something in the far periphery. And then the mean deviation over here is the center weighted average of all of these points here. So again, the central points are more reproducible and more important, and so this number is center-weighted. And so on average, this person is down 12.99 decibels, which is highly significant at p-value of less than 0.5%. All right, so this point, 13 decibels, less sensitive than expected for a 53-year-old. And here's just an example of center weighting. So you can see that these two circled points are both down by six decibels from expected. But the one that's closest to the center is assigned a highly significant probability of this being abnormal, whereas the one in the periphery is not. And this just showing this mean deviation over time and someone whose overall vision dropped and dropped and dropped because of cataract, and then the cataract was taken out, and now their vision is back, their mean deviation is back to pretty normal. A really important part of the field to get used to looking at is the pattern deviation. So a pattern deviation is a measure of focal loss. It's a, it determines whether points are significantly depressed compared to their neighboring points. So you can see these points are considered to be significantly depressed in pattern deviation. And then the sum total of that is considered the pattern standard deviation. So that's a measure of focal loss. The main function of this is to correct for media opacity. So if you have a field like this on the left, the total deviation is all depressed because this patient has cataract and glaucoma. So what the perimeter does is selects the seventh most sensitive point and sets that point as the zero point, which in this case is six decibels below normal for age. This is the seventh most 
sensitive non-edge point. It's not the seventh most normal point, seventh most sensitive. So here's a patient with a cataract, otherwise pretty normal looking visual field. You can see the total deviation is markedly depressed, but when you correct for the seventh most sensitive point, then the pattern deviation looks pretty normal. And just this is the concept and simple sketch. This is the hill of vision. You've now reduced the expected hill of vision and you're looking for dents in this hill, areas that are depressed more than the rest of the visual field. And this explains that disconnect that we see in false positives, because now the seventh most sensitive point is set at zero is actually 16 decibels above normal for age. So anything that doesn't make that ridiculously high cut is considered to be depressed for pattern deviation. And again, you see this white area here that should always make you think of false positivity, 57% false positives, and this disconnect, normal total deviation, abnormal pattern deviation. So the glaucoma hemifield test, we can see here it says outside normal limits. And what this test does is to take blocks of test points above and below the horizontal and compares them. So if there is arcuate loss, the glaucoma hemifield test will be abnormal because there is, as you can see, and this is a great example, it's a less than zero, 20 less than zero, where below it's 31, 31, 32. So clearly a big step off over the horizontal. The options for the hemifield test are within normal limits, outside normal limits, like in our patient, meaning that this would occur in less than 1% of normals. Borderline would occur in 1% to 3% of normals. General reduction sensitivity or abnormally high sensitivity are the choices. Sometimes it'll pick up early loss that's not that easy to see in the gray scale, like in this patient. You can see that the glaucoma hemifield test is outside normal limits. If you were just looking at the grayscale and you weren't looking at the raw data and the pattern deviation, you might miss the fact that this person has visual field loss. And this is the field we looked at earlier with the pseudo false positive look. The visual field index is another measure of global field loss. It's like the mean deviation. It's a tool for following progression, not making the diagnosis. You can see this patient's visual field index is 57%. It's supposed to be less affected by cataract than mean deviation. And it's relatively newer. It, it is a measure of global function. It's age corrected, center weighted but the, the range is more expanded and more consistent. So it goes from zero to 100, whereas the mean deviation goes from z plus numbers down to minus 29 to 35, depending on the age of the patient and things. So it's a little bit more consistent as a measure. And, and I really don't have a tremendous amount of experience using it because it's fairly new and it's not on all of our perimeters. So that's how you could look at a single field. Let's talk about measures of change. You can do an overview printout like this, where we're looking at this vis patient's visual field between the years 2001 and 2010. You can look at all of the parameters. Clearly, we're not doing a great job controlling this person's uh, glaucoma. You can also look at change analysis. There are three parts to the change analysis program. There are two parts here, short-term fluctuation, corrected pattern, standard deviation, that exist in full threshold perimeters, which very few people use anymore, so we're not going to talk about those. Uh, anytime you have a CETA field, which is marked by the S here, uh, those two parameters don't exist. This is a part that I don't personally use very much. It's called a box plus whisker. 
uh, from this whisker to this whisker from minus 20 decibels to plus two or so is the entire range of how depressed the points are in this person's field and 85% of the points are within this box. I see a lot of people with bad glaucoma where they're crashing on the bottom here and so I found that personally not to be very helpful. But I do like the mean deviation. This is just center weighted average followed over time. You can see this patient is getting worse. This is the same patient uh, that we showed all those fields across the page. So his overall average field is getting worse and he's developing more focal loss. So you can see here very stable and he started to develop this focal loss. This, this graph uh, does not continue to go down. This one does as people get worse and worse and worse. As patients lose more and more visual field, then the amount of focal loss becomes less and this uh, this turns and heads back up. So actually when this turns and goes back up, that's a very bad sign. So there's mean deviation, pa uh, pattern standard deviation. There is a glaucoma progression analysis. It takes two baseline visual fields usually not the first field because the first field has a learning effect. So these two fields were done in 2002, 2003, and this was from 2010. And it assigns probability of progression to all of the points. So you can see, for example, that this point is a less than 5% chance that it's worse. And in other words, it's worse with the less than 5% likelihood that that's a false assumption and that's been on three consecutive visual fields. So uh, this point is worse and it's been consistently worse over time. And the glaucoma progression analysis will say that this is likely progression in this patient's visual field. You can also look at the visual field index over time. You can see that this is trending down uh, the rate of progression of minus 2.1 decibel per year, and that's significant with a p-value of less than 0.1%. So let's talk about ways to vary the test performed. So we're doing a 24-2 threshold test, measuring the central 24 degrees using the dash two strategy. You can also measure other widths of the field. The 10 degree field is a very useful alternative. If you have somebody like this where there's very little field and it's all centered around the very central part of the field, you can just measure the central 10 degrees. It gives you a lot more to follow and you just don't have a lot of black ink on the page. If we have somebody where we're concerned about something in the periphery of the field, in our hospital, in our clinic, we would get a Goldman field. But if you want to look farther out, you can do a 3060-2 exam, and then you can merge those together. The, the automated perimeters are not great once you get outside of 20, 24 or 30 degrees. There are a lot of issues with rim artifact. And, and also in a field like this is a tremendous amount of time for the patient to do this field. But you can take any fields and merge them uh, to, to develop a more of an area studied or a more dense coverage of uh, an area of interest. So 24-2 means that we're using a dash two uh, strategy. So this is the dash one, and this is the original the, on the original octopus unit, where there are test points along the horizontal, test points along the vertical, and then every six degrees going out. The problem with that is that if you had a neurologic defect or a glaucomatous defect, these points may or may not be uh, affected because it's right on the area of interest. And so the dash two strategy moves the points three degrees above and below left and right of the uh, meridia. And so uh, we're not testing right along the horizontal, we're testing right above it or right below it. So we always use the dash two, uh, also for neurologic disease, you'd want to use the dash two. Uh, 
If you really wanted a very fine three degree pattern, you could do both a dash one and a dash two and make a denser study of the visual field. But I never do that, but you could if you wanted to. Stimulus size and color, this is stimulus size three, white. You can use anything from Goldman size one to Goldman size five. Really the only practical alternative to the size three, which is four square millimeters, is the size five, which is 64 square millimeters. We always use white on white, achromatic field, unless you're doing short wavelength automated perimetry, which is blue on yellow. So this is a patient who has a lot of visual field loss on their size three on the left, and on the right the same patient uh, done on the same day with the size five. And, and really, if I'm going to switch from a size 3 to 5 or size 24-2 to 10-2, I'll usually do the size 3, 24-2, just to make sure the patient's stable, and on the same day try to do the size 5 as a new baseline. The other thing you'll notice here is this patient has a lot less variability with the size 5. Uh, and some patients seem to perform better with size 5 than they do with size 3. We also notice that the test is much longer because there's not a CETA strategy. It's 11 uh, and a half minutes as opposed to seven and a half minutes. So we're using the CETA, Swedish Interactive Testing Algorithm, which is a way of speeding up the test compared to a full threshold test. And this is a standard. There is a fast version, which is a little bit quicker, but has more variability and really should, should not be used routinely for following people with disease. You can do a full threshold. So if you have a really old perimeter, you might only have the full threshold op uh, option. And then swap, which was in vogue for a while because it was felt to pick up earlier field loss with a blue on yellow targets. But there's some question that that's really not that helpful, and, and I almost never use that. Some people do for patients with very early disease or with no disease trying to pick up the earliest possible loss. Let's talk about a few pitfalls and errors because you really don't want to interpret a field that's uninterpretable. We've talked about false positives and false negatives. It's important to look for those fixation losses in the gaze tracker. Just a few other things that are less common but important to recognize. You know, if the field is stable, has good performance parameters, the interpretation is fast. You look at performance, you look at the mean deviation, pattern standard deviation, total and pattern deviation here, and if that's all stable, you're, you're pretty much done looking at the field. But if the field is changed, especially if it's unexpectedly changed, then you really need to dig deeper. And what I'm going to do is just talk about a few of these things. Recognize first that there's a learning curve and the patient's first field may not be completely reliable or believable. This is a subtle example. You can see the top field here has a little bit of scattered defects in both the total and the pattern deviation here. The hemifield test is not fooled. It thinks this is a normal field. But when you repeat the field, you can see that the performance is much, much better and the quality of the field is, is excellent, completely normal. Well, let's take a few parts of this field. Upper right, it tells you that this is the left eye, but sometimes a perimetrist does the wrong eye, hopefully rarely. So this says that it's a right eye. The blind spot should be here. Uh, but in fact, the blind spot's on the other side, so the, uh, the wrong eye was tested. Up in the upper right also tells you the patient's birth date, calculates their age, so this 53-year-old patient. Sometimes those numbers are entered wrong. This, this is a 69-year-old man who came a very long ways to see me because his visual field was suddenly worse in his only good eye. You can see that his mean deviation is minus 6.17 decibels. We repeated his field, and the mean deviation is down to minus 1.5 decibels, much better, much improved. But when you look at this patient's field, you can see that the grayscale looks the same. You can see that the pattern deviation looks exactly the same. 
But what's different is the total deviation. This looks a lot better than this. And the reason is because the patient's birth date was entered erroneously. On the left is a visual field compared to normal two-year-olds. And yes, the machine can extrapolate down to ages where you can't test people. And this is his actual 69-year-old self. So the grayscale looks the same, pattern deviation. The only thing that's different is total deviation, which is a comparison with age, corrected normals, and then the mean deviation, which of course is a center weighted average. Again, pretty uncommon mistake. More common is looking at the visual acuity and the prescription. If someone's had a sudden, or not sudden, but a dis distinct drop in visual acuity with the 2025 last time and now they're 2300, you would expect their visual field to be globally depressed. You also need to pay attention to the prescription. So this patient, uh, planet plus one diopter sphere and a diopter and a half of cylinder, there is a near ad used for people, uh, especially presbyopic people. Here's a patient myopic woman, suddenly worse visual field. You can see that the hemifield test is normal. There's no pattern deviation, but her total deviation is depressed, mean, devi mean deviation down to by minus 3.27 decibels. She was corrected with a minus 375 sphere, but she'd had LASIK in between. And when she's corrected with her Plano prescription, because she's uh, a young patient, she doesn't need a near add, uh, her field becomes completely normal. I put this with prescription because rim artifacts are more commonly seen in people who have plus lenses. Uh, and a rim artifact looks just like this. You can imagine that you're seeing the rim of the correcting lens. You notice this sudden drop off from 25 decibels to less than zero. And it's black in the very far periphery. It does not follow the nerve fiber layer pattern at all. Usually with plus lenses, it can also be in a patient who's drifting back from the headrest and the perimeter, and so they're farther away than they should be. Here's a more subtle example. You can see loss above and below doesn't follow the nerve fiber layer pattern. As I said earlier, the fovea is the most important point in your visual field. Here it's a 35 decibel fovea. And it's often turned off. We always have it turned on because I want to know how the fovea is functioning. But how do they measure the foveal threshold? They cannot project a target here. That's the camera. We're looking from the inside of the bowl. This is the patient's view. And so the perimeter makes a, a pattern down below and tests the fovea right here. But if the patient fails to refixate back up at the target, then the blind spot will be down here because the patient is looking down the entire time that he or she is doing the visual field. And you get this very characteristic drooping, low-hanging blind spot. Or you get a horizontal defect that does not respect the horizontal meridian, but is hanging low. So this patient, left and right and left eye, and both eyes failed to refixate back up at the appropriate target. And when they were instructed properly, all that went away. Sometimes you'll see a field defect like this that has this dense superior defect, but it doesn't really follow the nerve fiber layer pattern. It extends down here below uh, the blind spot. This does not look like the nerve fiber layer does. And this is somebody with a drooping, uh, drooping eyelid, and when it was taped, all that went away. Just a few closing comments. First, some people can't do visual fields. This is a patient who has enormous false positivity. This whole thing is white. Um, and the again, the disconnect here. On repeat, instead of false positivity, patient had lots and lots of false negativity. So some people can't do automated field testing or field testing at all. On the other hand, some patients will surprise you. You might not think that you can get a visual field on a 92-year-old patient, but this person's performance was spectacular.
An important point is that patients generally don't make up glaucomatous defects. So this is this person has terrible performance scores. Five of six fixation losses, 33% false positive, 21% false negative score, gaze tracker that's all over the map. But this defect, this superior arcuate defect that follows the nerve fiber layer and respects a horizontal, is, is real. But it's telling you that you don't want to follow this patient for subtle changes if they continue to have this sort of performance characteristics. When in doubt, repeat. So there's three things you can do if the field is worse. You can react to it, which you would do if everything, the an optic nerve and the intraocular pressure and the visual field all pointed to worsening, then you should react. You could ignore it, which if you're going to ignore a change in the visual field and then make you wonder why you did the visual field in the first place. Or you can repeat the field. And this field on the right, is from a patient who was tested three times in the same day. And you can see that there's a lot of variability in this patient. So if you see a field that's surprisingly worse and it doesn't fit the nerve, doesn't fit the pressure or the patient's disease course, you should always repeat it. And lastly, a lot of this is pattern recognition. This sharp drop off the less than zero that doesn't respect the retinal nerve fiber layer pattern that we see in rim artifacts, clover leaf field that we see in excessive false negatives, this disconnect between total deviation and pattern deviation that I've probably hammered into the ground too hard, but this goes along with excessive false positivity, the low hanging blind spot that we see in people who fail to refixate at the proper target. So hopefully, next time you see a visual field, you won't be daunted by it. You'll have a, an idea of how to approach it, and you will not interpret fields that are non-interpretable, and you'll do a good job in field, interpreting the ones that have good data in them. So a very long talk. Uh, I hope I didn't put you all to sleep.